Our scripture lesson is taken from 2 Samuel chapter 21, beginning at verse 1. During the reign of David, there was a famine for three successive years, so that David sought the face of the Lord. The Lord said, It is on account of Saul and his blood-stained house It is because he put the Gibeonites to death. The king summoned the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not a part of Israel, but were survivors of the Amorites. The Israelites had sworn to spare them, but Saul in his zeal for Israel and Judah had tried to annihilate them. David asked the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? What shall I make? How shall I make amends so that you will bless the Lord's inheritance? The Gibeonites answered him, We have no right to demand silver or gold from Saul or his family, nor do we have the right to put anyone in Israel to death. What do you want me to do for you? David asked. Now remember, the people that are stating this are not believers. They were unbelievers who were never part of Israel. But Joshua and the leaders of Israel had sworn an oath to them in the name of the Lord to spare them, even though they had been deceived by them. And so when you read this verse 5, you need to remember, this is not what God wants people to do in any way whatsoever. It's the demand that these pagans make in order to lift the curse that they had put on Israel that had a substance to it, because Israel had sworn in the name of the Lord. Verse 5, they answered the king, as for the man who destroyed us and plotted against us so that we have been decimated and have no place anywhere in Israel, let seven of his male descendants be given to us to be killed and exposed before the Lord at Gibeah of Saul, the Lord's chosen one. So the king said, I will give them to you. And then skipping down to the next page, page 508, we read these words. In verse 14, page 508, they buried the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan in the tomb of Saul's father Kish at Zelah in Benjamin, and did everything the the king commanded. After that, God answered prayer in behalf of the land. The word of the Lord. May we pray. Help me, Lord, to present Scripture clearly, concisely, compellingly, with the winsomeness of the Holy Spirit, for the sake of Jesus. Amen. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, and beginning at verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 13. Excuse me. I'm glad to be down where there's some humidity in the air because it's pleasant for a moment, but uh, those altitudes affect everything, including this Bell's palsy. So uh, I'm glad that I'm back. First Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 13. Who is going to harm you? if you are eager to do good. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. 
May God add his blessing to his word. I want to give you the reason why I'm preaching this little series called Scandalous Text. What is a scandal? Biblically, and using the Greek word, it means a stumbling block, something that people trip over. I had to be very careful as I did some walking with my daughter, son-in-law, and grandson, and Sandy in Arizona. I always looked down. I looked down so that I wouldn't trip on a rock or put my foot in a hole or something else. There are things that trip us up that cause us to fall down, and believe me, I don't need another fall at my age. So, scandalous texts are texts that cause people to stumble, to fall. And we live in an era of nonsense. What do I mean? I look back at Dr. Reap, a medical doctor who devoted many years of his life to become licensed to practice medicine. But I'll guarantee you that Dr. Reap has encountered people with their degree in Googleology, that is, the ability to read Google, who will challenge what he says. Well, that's not what I believe, because da 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 And people, remember this. In the modern world with, with Google and Bing and all these other search engines, people can post virtually anything they want to post, and nobody really is doing fact-checking. In fact, I've learned with the internet that fact-checkers sometimes maliciously malign the truth and say, this isn't true when it really is true. We've lived in an era in the modern world unlike any other in the history of humankind where people who know virtually nothing about anything can string together Nonsense that sounds, sounds so compelling. And nowhere is that greater uh, than in the area of religion and the Bible. And so people that know virtually nothing about the Bible itself, but because of one reason or another, perhaps how they were raised by uh, parents that were ultra strict, ultra mean, and, and did not communicate in any way the love of Christ, have an anger and a hostility towards God and towards the Bible, and they write things, and they will challenge people and say, well, did you know the Bible does this? Do you know the Bible does that? One of the things that I enjoyed at our General Assembly this past year was sitting under a, 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 an hour-long lunch with my former associate pastor who makes movies. And uh, Richie gave a critique of how to watch a film. And he described certain things, said, well, would this be a Christian film? And he gave some illustrations that websites that critique films from a Christian standpoint uh, rate them a certain way. He said, for example, they'll say it had 14 S words and uh, this, that, and the other. And he said to himself, I wonder, did they just sit there and count? (laughs) And uh, he gave a critique of a film that's not a Christian film, but is a profoundly Christian film, and that's Groundhog Day. And he showed how that it has redemption in it, it has this in it, it has that in it. And Richie makes movies. In fact, his film that he's, he produced, the author, is about to be publicly released. And it looks like it's going to be a great movie. But anyhow, so you look at the world around you, and you, and you examine the world in light of things, and, and oftentimes Christians are very poor in their analysis of the world around them. They give glib, ridiculous comments about things when the reality is something is very often the opposite. So I want to address scandalous texts, texts that make people stumble. And perhaps that's made you stumble. Because I have a twofold purpose in this little short series, Scandalous Texts. One is to try to remove the doubts that Christians have about God and His Word. And two is, and this is what's so important, is to enable you, and I mean you. I'm talking about you, being able to defend the faith, the Christian faith, to other people. Because why are you still alive? Think about it. Why has God spared your life? Why has God spared my life? There's one fundamental reason. reason. It's to glorify God by reaching other people with the good news about Jesus. Do you know that most people really don't understand the gospel? 
they've grown up in a, in a church uh, that was a certain way. Do you know that my wife's church, when she was a little girl, and it was a huge mega church in Jacksonville, Florida. It was called originally Beaver Street Baptist Church. And then when they outgrew their facility and decided to move, they renamed it the Jacksonville Baptist Temple. And so when Sandy, while I was a student pastor of a little Presbyterian church in 1969, near Clinton, South Carolina, she joined that church. And the person who typed the bulletin said, today we receive Sandy Vincent by transfer of letter from the Beaver Temple of Jacksonville, Florida. Is that like the Moose Lodge or Elks? Anyhow, but her pastor, when she was a little girl, taught this from the pulpit, that black people are not human. They were created by God to serve white people. Now, to us today, that sounds bizarre. I mean, to us today. But believe me, when I was growing up, that wasn't so far from what people generally believed. And we've come a long way. In many ways, we've come a good way. In many ways, we've come a bad way. The important thing in assessing where we have been and where we are is, does it line up with Scripture? So, scandalous text, trying to deal with things that have caused people to stumble and hate God and reject the church. And so, listen to his counsel here. He says in verse 15, 1 Peter 3, 15, But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. I want my life, how I conduct myself, what I speak, I want my life to remind people of Jesus. I want people to be provoked to ask me questions. I want people to say to me, you seem very different. Why? I want that to happen. That's the reason I want to continue to live. If I can't do that anymore, let me die and go be with Jesus. Seriously. The reason I live is I want people to see Christ in me. Now, they, he doesn't always, they don't always see Christ in me. When I had a person wheeling a wheelchair in the Dallas airport after our plane was delayed for an hour coming out of Denver, and I couldn't understand the man who was speaking to me because I'm not sure where he was from. Some people were from Nepal. Other people were from Ethiopia. But I couldn't understand, and I became angry. I became angry, and as, as I was passed off to someone else, a lady who was from Nepal, who was very sweet, I began to be convicted. Now, that really wasn't the way I want people to remember me, because I have a booming voice, and I began to speak loudly to get somebody's attention other than the man who was from, I could never figure out where he was from because I couldn't understand him. I need help. I understand that the plane to Texarkana has not yet left. And I got help. But then as, as I'm being wheeled by this sweet lady uh, who, was, who was from Tibet, um, and I was able at the end in thanking her to do this, and, uh, which is the Buddhist way of saying thanks. And uh, no, I don't always exhibit Christ. Sometimes I get angry. Thank God that his using me doesn't depend on my personal perfection. Because if it did, I may as well go, okay, I'll see you later. (laughs) But I want my life to reflect Christ in such a way that people say, you seem so different. Why are you happy? Do you know that happiness is an amazing phenomenon in our modern world? Most people are terribly depressed. Suicide is at an all-time, ho- ho- all-time high. And the use of psychotropic drugs to cope with life's sadness is higher than it's ever been in the history of humankind. I want people to say, why are you happy? Why do you have hope? 
Why are you an optimist? I'm stuck on a hope, uh, on a thing called hope. And, uh, and so he says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. Be prepared. What is my task as your pastor, a pastor teacher? It's to equip you to do the work of, the, of ministry. This church will not survive if you hire somebody to do the work of the ministry. And that's why churches throughout America are dying. The job of a pastor is to equip you to do the work of the ministry. And that's what I'm trying to do today, is to equip you to do the work of the ministry. It's to give you answers to these texts that maybe your children or grandchildren have been alerted to somewhere, and, uh, and they say, I, I can't believe the Bible, Grandpa. I don't believe that stuff. This is ridiculous. How could a God, da 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 and so on. So he says, I want to, you to be prepared to give an answer. Peter's not writing this to pastors. He is writing it to pastors, but he's also writing it to the people of the churches to whom he was addressing himself. And he says, always, he says, be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you. What's the first thing you do when you get asked a ridiculous question? Pray. Because you're not smart. You say, well, what do you mean I'm not smart? Well, that's what I do. I say, Lord, I'm not smart. I don't know how to give an answer here. And, and I need a help. I need you to tell me what you want me to say. Please, Lord, put it in my mind. Help me recall things that I've heard and even things I've never heard about. And just give me wisdom as I respond to this person because what comes out of my, my, my mouth has eternal consequences. And so he says, notice here, he says, the hope that you have. Notice how he says to do it in that next sentence, top of page 1890. But do this with gentleness and respect. Let's think about it for a moment. Do this with gentleness. The Greek word that's translated gentleness there is a word that means not really being hung up on your own importance. Guess what? I have trouble with that. So do you. Because I think I'm important. I think that it's very important how people treat me. Like putting people to work in the Dallas airport and the Denver airport who don't speak English clearly enough to be understood. I'm grateful that people uh, that speak other languages have somebody they can understand. But that annoyed me. And I think I'm important. I paid for those tickets. I paid for the help. I think I'm important. Don't you think I'm important? <laughs> but you know, that's what we all deal with, isn't it? I'm important. I'm important. And I'm kind of stuck on myself. Are you stuck on yourself? And you know, here's the problem. When I'm stuck on myself, when I'm focused on my importance, I need to get to that plane so that I don't have to spend the night in the Dallas airport and in the beginning, there was only one other person around us in that section. It was a lot of fun exploring places there and able to buy a, a bottle of water and some potato chips so we could take our vitamins before we went to sleep. And then people would come in and they would talk and wake us up. It was surreal. Wow. But I think I'm important. We all do. But listen, here's the issue. I want to be like Jesus. I want the man from whatever country in the world he was saying he was from to think for a moment and say, wow, sir, tell me. And I can say truly that God was with me as I repented for being focused on my own importance. God enabled me to be gracious to the lady from Nepal and even to pray with her. Wow. So it's when I forget about myself and how important I am, and that's really hard to do if we're honest, if I can focus on what's really important. What is the big thing? The big thing is the Lord Jesus and not presenting a stumbling block so that people can get in touch with Him. Because religion has never done anybody any good. Marx was right on one point. It is the opiate of the people. But Jesus does great good for people. 
The great goal of the Christian is to connect other people with Jesus. And so he says to do it with gentleness. And again, gentleness is is an inadequate translation. It's true as far as it goes, but the gentleness flows out of a heart that says, you know, I'm not really important. I'm not going to be focused on how people view me, this, that, and that. If I look like a fool by being sweet and kind and gentle and turning the other cheek and forgiving other people, so be it. He says, with gentleness and respect. The Greek word there is the word for fear. And what does he mean to fear people? It's not really fearing people. It's what the Christian has towards God. For the Christian, there is no fear in the sense of terror, fear of consequences. For the Christian, it's simply respect. And you know, it's important for me to show respect towards everyone. From the youngest person, good morning Theo, you're the youngest one here today, normally it's Iona, but today you win the contest, and um, to show respect. Do you know that God has called me to show respect to Theo? And Theo, thank you for helping your mom make a great poster that greeted us in the Texarkana airport yesterday, welcome home Bob and Sandy. I wouldn't be surprised you didn't have part in that. So to show respect, my obligation is to show respect to everyone. You know, I'm struck with that when I eat and out, and we've had to eat out a lot this week, so uh, past two weeks, so I'm sure that probably put on a pound or two, hopefully not more. And um, I'm struck with how waiters and waitresses deal with you. Now, I have the power of the tip, but I always tip 20% because those people don't make a lot. And I was struck last night as we ate a meal, and the guy kept calling me buddy. And I thought, okay, all right, okay. I almost talked to him, but then I thought, what matters most? His name was Oliver, and he kept calling me buddy. And he was, he was probably at least, probably close to 50 years younger than I am. You know what I say to people? I say sir and ma'am to everybody. Everybody. I say sir and ma'am. Why? It's a habit I want to get into. Why? Because it's a way of showing respect. I remember as a boy saying sir to someone who, was, who did not look like me. And I was corrected and told, don't say sir to somebody that looks like that. And I thought, wow, that's nuts. No, I want to be in a habit so that even, yes sir, Theo, Even to Theo, I'm going to say, yes, sir, because it's important to show respect. And if I get in the habit of doing that, well, then I'm not going to show disrespect. So he says to show them with gentleness, kindness, putting yourself in their place with a genuine humility that's focused on their need, not my need, and with real respect. And he says, Keeping a clear conscience. What's that? Verse 16. That's what happened to me in a wheelchair in the Dallas airport as the lady from Nepal wheeled us to another location. I, I walk with a cane to keep from falling, and as long as I walk, walk slowly, I have no problem. But if I had to try to run, I couldn't do it. So we get wheelchairs, and, and that was good. What had happened? What happened is I became convicted. The Holy Spirit began to talk to my conscience, and he began to alert me to how, I need somebody to get me to the gate where the plane for Texarkana is getting to leave because I've been told by my contact on the phone that it hasn't left yet. So as I'm being wheeled to that gate, I began to get my conscience cleared keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak against, uh, speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Let me say this. Many things are written against the church that are true and not slanderous. Because if you look at the history of Christianity, from about 325 A.D. on, Christianity has not had a very good track record. What happened in 325? The Edict of Milan of 313, granted by the Emperor Constantine I, became 
enable Christianity in 325 to become the official religion of the Roman Empire. And all you have to do is read history, and you discover, huh, Lord, these people weren't acting like Christians at all. They did terrible things. Church history is a record of the atrocious ideas and actions of the church. Wow, it really is, with rare exceptions. I think about the Moravians. You know, the famous Moravian hymn, Jesus, Thy Blood and Righteousness, written by Count Zinzendorf. Do you know what the Moravians did? They were a missionary group, and they wanted to be missionaries to everyone. And so two young men sold themselves into slavery so that they could minister to the slaves that were, uh, I believe, on Barbados. That's nuts. That's crazy. Isn't that insane? Nobody would do that who thought of their own importance, would they? Why would you ever sell yourself into slavery in order to become a slave so you could share Christ with slaves? Wow. What an example. And, he, and so they may be ashamed of their slander. Here's what I want to say. Most evil things that are said about the church are not slanderous. But let me say this. Anything that's said evil about Jesus is a slander. And I want people to be able to introduce Jesus to other people. Because what I offer you is not myself. It's not my message. It's not my eloquence or my knowledge. It is simply a relationship I have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Sadly, as I read church history, it seems apparent to me that most people who led Christianity since 325 didn't really have a personal relationship with Jesus at all. I can't defend the church in that sense, but I can defend the Lord Jesus Christ, and I can defend His Bible. And that's what my goal is for you, to be able to defend the faith by giving you a little bit of information that will help you to reach others. So what is my message? And I address this particularly to those of you who may be watching. My message is simply this. Don't get hung up on how you've been treated by so-called Christians, because all Christians are imperfect. We all stumble in many ways. We all come short of being what we ought to be. And don't, don't reject Jesus because of what you've been taught. Know this, no matter what you've done, no matter what your lifestyle is, no matter what your goals in life are, you are welcome today to come to Jesus don't let conscience make you linger, nor a fitness fondly dream. All the fitness He requires is to feel your need of Him. Come to Jesus just the way you are. And this I can promise you, as God is my witness, you will not be disappointed. No one has ever come to Jesus Himself and left disappointed. That's a fact. Jesus loves you, and He wants you to come to Him. And he wants to establish a relationship with you. Now you'll say, but you know, Bob, I'm in a relationship that, well, I know it doesn't, well, I'm not sure I can really come to Jesus. And I'm going to say to you this, come to Jesus just the way you are. Don't worry about the relationship you happen to be in now. As he begins to walk with you and talk with you along life's narrow way, you'll discover in him a breadth of of joy and peace, and He will change your desires, and He will change relationships around you. So the big deal is this. Don't let something get in the way of you and Jesus. Don't let texts that you've heard about and read and said to yourself, how could a good God have permitted this? Don't let those things get in the way. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ just the way you are. Pray a prayer like this. Lord Jesus I know I've messed up. Lord Jesus, I know that I fall short of being what I want to be. Lord Jesus, I've got a lot of doubts. Lord Jesus, I've got a lot of struggles. Lord Jesus, help me. Help me that I can come to you just the way you are, knowing that you receive me just the way I am. 
and give me your Holy Spirit so that I may know you and know that I know you. And lead me. I want to give up on myself and give my heart to you. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today. Come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Amen. Our next hymn is number 349, Oh How He Loves You and Me.